If we're lucky enough to have a can, use the wire from the survival tin to make a handle. Never leave the tin balancing on burning embers or on rocks, as it will topple and you'll lose your water and probably put the fire out. Now boil the water for seven minutes at sea level. For every thousand feet of elevation, add another minute. Potassium permanganate is a good way of sterilising water. The small container like this from the survival tin is good for sterilising 300 gallons of water. Now it's important that we get the colour just right. If I don't put sufficient in, the water will still be suspect. If I put too much in, the water becomes caustic. So in a small amount of water like this, just one or two crystals is sufficient. And we go by colour. We want this to be a light pink. That's just about the right colour. This is a dried up water course and if we dig down long enough, deep enough, eventually we come to water. We can still collect that water however, but we now can let the trees pump it up for us. Take a plastic bag and place it on the leaf of any green tree and the tree acts as a pump. It takes the water from the ground and we get evaporation in the plastic bag and all we've got to do is collect it without all the manual labour of digging for it. This is a solar still that we use in semi-arid and desert conditions. It's a metre square of plastic sheet. You dig a hole a metre square, one metre deep, and you arrange the plastic sheet and weight it so it forms a V. Now what happens, this causes condensation. Water, it forms underneath the V and it runs down to the bottom and you need a container underneath to collect the moisture. We can make this more efficient by putting any green vegetation in it or urinating in it. To save disturbing the still, we can also use a siphon. Now with a siphon, you can take the water exactly when you need it. There's no need to purify the water, it's absolutely pure. Now as you can see in the still, it's also a good insect trap. Let's have a look underneath the still and see how much water we have collected. Under ideal conditions, this is good for a quart of water. We've got probably a pint here, it's been in six hours, so we're doing okay. Now, don't make these any bigger, the metre square is the optimum. If you need more water, carry more sheets of polythene and dig more solar still. Ensure that the siphon is right to the bottom of your collector. Now, as you can see, the water is nice and pure and does not need sterilising. Remember, if you're going to urinate in here, make sure you do it before you put in the collecting pot. Another method of collecting water is a dew trap. Let's take a look at one. This is a dew trap. What we've got now is clear plastic sheet in a hole a foot square and a foot deep. In the hole, we place clean, smooth rocks. Now, this still has been working all night for us. The way it works is, the plastic cools off more rapidly than the hot stone. And this creates condensation. Now you must ensure you take the water out before the sun comes up. Otherwise it works in reverse and it starts evaporating the water that you've collected. Still using the sun, I'd like to show you now a solar still inverted. Here we've got a source of suspect water. What we're going to do is take clear plastic sheet in put it over the top of it, seal it round the bottom and the sun's going to do the rest. With all these solar stills, we must use clear plastic sheeting, not the dark variety. In this case, I've put a pebble in the centre of my plastic sheet, I've tied it around to form an anchor point, and I've suspended it from a convenient branch. I've then formed a tent over the suspect water, and then I've carefully rolled the polythene inside, and this is going to trap the water as it evaporates inside my tent. I've sealed it all the way around the edge, and we leave this now, and the warmer the sun is, the better this works. Okay, Lofty, I understand how the solar still works, but tell me again how you get the water out. 
Okay, we carefully wrap the polythene underneath and when we want the water, what we do, we start lifting it out from the side carefully and tilting it to the lowest part of the still and in time we turn the still right upside down and the water is all collected in the polythene curl at the lowest point. After the water is filtered, like you did in the sock, is the water safe to drink at that point? No, Steve, we must always treat the water. Regardless of water source or how clear and sparkling the water looks, the filter only takes out the suspended matter, it don't take out the bacteria. So we must always treat what we've got in our container, either by boiling or by chemicals. Okay, boiling water is okay if you have a metal container, but what if you don't have one? Okay, Steve, imagine this is a sheet of birch bark. We can fold this carefully. Okay, fold in the sides, fold up the ends, make the creases to the rear, fold it over, do the same this end. What we made now is a coolerman. Now, if we put this, okay, on ashes filled with water, what we got, we got moisture inside, indirect heat, and the water will boil in this without rupturing the vessel. <laughs> Very clever. Lofty, why don't you sum up the important things we need to remember about water? Okay, Steve, every living thing on Earth is dependent on water. So what we say is we go three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food with no ill effects. So regardless of water source, we must always treat it. Now, if we've not got any water, we just don't eat because it takes all our body fluids to assimilate the food. And fats and proteins are the worst. And also, appetite will suffer. So if we've got no water, we don't eat. However, if we've got water, a plentiful supply of good water, we can eat just about anything. And in tight situations, it's been recorded that people have eaten their leather boots and they've got protein from it but you must have lots of water to digest it and for the body to assimilate the food. Okay, let's hope we don't have to eat our boots. You've mentioned food. Now, what kinds of food are we going to find in the wild? Okay, Steve, in the wild there's a variety of foods and it starts with the nutritional ladder. Right at the bottom we've got plants. Now it's just a matter of recognition and picking. They're not going to run away. And then we build up fungi, slightly more nutritional value than plants, insects, Probably the first living thing an injured person can get are insects. Above insects come fish, if you're lucky enough to be, to be by water, we've got the fish in the water, and then finally, game. Pound for pound, we can't beat meat. Of all the plants available, some are edible, some may even be poisonous. How can we tell the difference? Okay, with plants, and it's only plants, we've got an edibility test. This is the edibility test. We pick a fresh specimen and first we use the senses. Feel it, it might be prickly or hairy and this will indicate what it is. Next, we crush it and we smell it. There may be a familiar smell like mint or garlic. This will also indicate what it is. We then take a small portion and we place it underneath the tongue and this is where the flavour buds are. Now if there's any discomfort like a burning or stinging sensation, discard it, you've got a poisonous plant. There are two poisons in the plant kingdom and they're both accompanied by the same sign, i.e. a burning, stinging sensation. Now one is water soluble, one is not. So with nettles, when we boil them, we destroy the toxin and they're safe to eat. If we do the same with rhubarb leaves, we concentrate the poison. Now if there's no discomfort, we chew the same piece and we put all the juice around the mouth and we spit it out. We wait a further five minutes and again, any discomfort, discard the test. Finally, we swallow the same specimen and now we wait five hours. If there's no ill effect, we can say that plant is safe to eat. However, it's a long drawn out process and it's so much easier to identify some of the common plants. So let's go and have a look and see what we can find. The bulrush is an excellent source of nourishment. Now in late summer, it's got the familiar seed spike on the top and we can eat all parts of this. What we're looking for here is the rootstock. Now the root of any plant is a storehouse and it contains good starch so it's an excellent source of nourishment. The dandelion is very common and easily recognised by its flower. When it's not in bloom its distinctive leaf also helps to identify it. Now all parts of the plant are edible and we cook the leaf just like spinach. Now the plant also has a tap root and if we expose this it's best by roasting the root and it also makes a palatable coffee. We can also cook this like parsnip. The plant